Hey, what's up everybody? Video 44 coming at you another video. All right, so good morning. It's Wednesday morning and uh, I'm not really sure exactly what I want to say. I've been up for about 30 minutes now. Even though it looks like it's like 5 in the morning, it's actually like almost 7 a.m. But uh, yeah, um, first thing I'm thinking about is Emi Udoka getting back uh, into coaching with the Brooklyn Nets. I just saw a meme uh, that showed a picture of him in a uh, Celtics, I guess, uh, pregame studio session uh, where he was in there with the, with, the, with the studio folks and the whole nine. And I guess he was just having a conversation with the lady uh, and they zoomed in on his face and his face looked like it was like, you know, really intense as if it was some creepy vibes going or something like that. And, and it, you know, it was just like a one of those zoom in four pictures where they zoom in into the face each picture a little closer that kind of thing but uh you know so the, the caption said it's ridiculous that this man is getting this getting back into coaching this fast and while i don't look at it as ridiculous it's not like oh my god i'm appalled what i am saying is this is kind of one of them situations where it's just like now i've come become aware of the brooklyn nets you know it's the core uh knows Emmy very well I didn't know that he was an assistant coach with them before he even went to the Celtics I didn't remember that although I knew he was an assistant coach a lot of places I just didn't know where he was last at before just so I'm be Brooklyn so I can understand why they want to bring him in all the more reason why because they feel like they could uh you know wrap their arms around him and, 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 and bring him in and make him a part of what they want to do long term that should be the plan I hope they're not bringing Emmy in to fix what they have here now and then if it doesn't work out they move on that's the wrong way to approach uh, one of the best coaches in basketball. You gotta, you gotta have him as the first piece of your rebuild if you're if you're looking at it clearly. But um, either way, I look at the Brooklyn Nets and I say, you know, the joke about all of this for me, and it is just a joke, but it's 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 kind of funny. It's like essentially, if the man got some type of sex addiction, that's the addiction or something like that, they essentially just tell him to go walk it off. Like, bro, that's not <laughs> that's not how this works. If he has something going on like that that had him acting outside of himself to the detriment of his entire career, I don't think that just because his team sent him away and that you have the right to go get him, that he's necessarily being sent away just out of punishment. I think they sent the man away because he needs to go figure some things out, and it's going to take some time to do that. And I just think the Brooklyn Nets are... Um, and I got to word this carefully because I think I think there may be some of his friends in this trying to bring him there from what the reports are saying. But I just think they're kind of neglecting what it is his process is. And it might be to the detriment of the man, to be honest with you. I think it might be it, no telling what, what really is going on, because a lot of times the media will hype stuff up. And we know this story is specifically uh, unique in the regards to how it's been covered. So, of course, you can always leave room for character smearing and lies and just flat out stuff that isn't necessarily the case but all in all if I'm looking at what I'm hearing about the situation I just say there's room for concern as it pertains to bringing him back too early especially bringing him into this locker room I can see if you were bringing him into Utah or bringing him into Indiana where there's nothing going on it's all subtlety everybody's looking to take their time and win but uh when somebody's talking about winning right now and the situation is that they fired a coach because he couldn't make something that didn't really fit work and you're bringing in a guy who has the controversy that he has attached to him. I just don't think that makes any real sense. Not no real sense. It's like a Hail Mary play to hopefully save something that should probably be blown up. And I just think it's the same kind of behavior that's put them in this hole in the first place. I'm just looking for the Lakers and the Nets to learn their lessons and stop making the same mistake. Uh, and I and I point out those two teams, but it's a third team that's involved in that as well, and it's the Clippers as well, to be honest with you. All of the teams that still are trying to build uh, with three max players or players that have a foundation of, of, of history of being injured for an extended period of time, if those two things are going on and you don't have any picks, um, there's something that I think these organizations are missing in regards to their assessment of what they're doing, and that is... The expectations of tomorrow will meet you just as intensely as the expectations of today. So if you don't sacrifice something, 
One of these days, you're going to have to sacrifice what you refuse to sacrifice now and sit in the space you're at now and be there. That's what these, these teams don't understand. You can't keep kicking this can down the road. Eventually, the lack of assets is going to catch up with you unless you do something to assure that it doesn't. And that thing is trading away that core and resetting that timeline and giving you back that cap space. And then from there, getting your picks back either in trade or just letting this process happen so that those picks can come back naturally and then not mortgaging those picks for situations and opportunities such as these ever again. That's how you do that. You don't do that. Um, and, it, and these two teams particularly, three teams particularly, need to undo what they have going on so they don't drive themselves further into a hole. Now, when you look at Steve Ballmer, his situation is a bit dim different because of his obvious financial uh, you know, strengths. He doesn't have to worry about luxury tax. He doesn't have to even pull out his pocketbook when assessing this project that is the Clippers. He just can continue to throw money into it based on his position in life. So I don't look at him and say, you better figure it out. I look at him and say, if whatever it takes to figure it out, he can always figure it out. Whatever it takes to rebuild, and he can do everything he needs to do to assure his team has a, the timeline he wants it to have at any given moment, so long as he's willing to throw as much money as possible at it. So he don't have that problem. With respect to the other owners, he's just in another world, man. And we all respect that and know that, and that's that. But his team is still in the same position. If they don't get rid of some of those pieces that are not sturdy, uh, they're going to find themselves in a big hole, and they don't have their picks either. They do not have the picks. So I think they're playing with the future toying with the present and neither of those situations really look that promising it's one of the teams that don't have that problem that's probably going to capture the championship so i just think it's time for those teams to reset and i think that getting emmy udoka in place uh could potentially be the right move so long as they're not looking for him to fix this don't fix this and i know the guys who are bringing him in are looking for him to fix this because that's a part of their timeline but if i'm joe Sai, i didn't bring him for that I didn't bring him for that. I bring him in for what happens after you guys are gone. Straight up. Because um, he's a culture setter. And you ain't establishing no culture over there. Right? Now, here's the thing that I'm also looking at. And you guys know I've been following Joe Size uh, from afar for, for a little bit now since we've been trying to uh, get his player Kyrie from him. <laughs> so, you know, I've been trying to keep the team, on, you know, fairly in, in my eyesight to a degree and Kyrie had a tough night last night and of course you know it's one of those things where it was big news because he's a big player and he's got a lot going on with his name so as soon as he struggles he's definitely gonna hear about it and you know he's been playing really really well but uh things have gotten to be a little different in regards to what he's probably looking at uh based on what's going on around the league with the Lakers, what's going on with the Nets, particularly firing the coach and all that. It's just a lot of changes, and I wonder uh, if he's wondering if things are changing in regards to whether or not he's going to be able to control his destiny uh, with the place he wants to go to, the Lakers. Because if he's listening to me, and you guys listen to me, you know that I don't think it makes any sense to trade two picks uh, at all if you're the Lakers anymore. I don't want to invest in this 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 roster anymore uh, that's that's my point of view at this point uh, and, and maybe that's a flaw in my personality because you don't want to abandon the plan right don't abandon the plan stick to the plan we got a plan it's going well why would you blow it up it's because when you start looking at certain things you start seeing them unfold and you start realizing that what you thought was possible looks even less possible and you know that this ain't as simple as bringing Kyrie Irving to your team it's not that simple this ain't as simple as getting Westbrook off your team. That's not, that's not all that we're doing when we move. What we're doing is getting rid of those two picks that, as I said, we'll likely want later on. So I look at this situation, I say, okay, Genie Bus, if you're not interested in re-signing Kyrie Irving, giving up two picks to acquire him to invest in this roster is a bad, bad decision. Because what he's going to end up doing is walking. And if you trade for him now, you ain't going to trade him at the deadline. That's stupid. To retain the value that otherwise would leave your organization. Now, I believe that Kyrie Irving would be more than happy to sign a multi-year deal with the Los Angeles Lakers. I believe he'd be happy to sign a one-year deal with the Los Angeles Lakers. But I don't know that. I don't know that. That's just me thinking. 
out loud. The reality is the Lakers would have to negotiate with him. They would have to accept him for who he is. And then we would have to believe that he can help us and believe we can put the pieces around him to assure that he can be the best self that he is. Then you got to figure out what they're going to do with AD's contract. You got to figure out if it makes sense to want to go forward with Ron. And if those things don't make sense, then trading for Kyrie Irving doesn't make sense either. The only reason why I'm trading for Kyrie Irving is because I'm trying to save this season. Because if I bring him in for anything else, then it's just about whether or not Jeannie wants to pay him. And I don't, you know, I, I don't want to invest in the that question, whether or not she's going to do that. I can't, as an, I can't as a GM. You know what I mean? I can't do that. Now, if, if she gives me assurances that she's looking to re-sign him or give him an extension immediately upon the trade, then I would feel a lot more comfortable about giving up those two picks or one of the picks because... I know he's going to be an asset that extends past this year. I don't have to walk him dark, to, watch him dark to Miami or the Clippers or something like that, right? So when I'm looking at the Lakers, I'm saying, okay, there is a chance where we bring him in this season and one of maybe three or four different things that are negative could happen and we still aren't good enough. And for me, if I'm giving up those picks, that can't be the risk. That's the reality of the situation. If that, those picks are leaving my organization, I need to know that Kyrie's going to be healthy, that we're good enough to win a championship, that he's going to be signed, re-signing with the team. Uh, you know what I mean? Those are the things I need assurances of. Everything else can't be assured of. Whether or not he stays healthy can't be assured of. Whether or not, you know what I mean, the world is going to do something and he's going to have to react to it from his position in the world. You know what I mean? As somebody who supports him, I'm not going to sit up here and say put basketball first with what I know he's going up against right now. Not necessarily. But at the same time, I would say you're in the space where Kaepernick was at. You're in the same space you was at when you were um, in the balance with the, uh, with the, with the uh, vaccine. You got to know that every time you take a stance, you affect your price tag. And when you affect your price tag, you affect my opinion as a fan for what it is it takes to pay for you. You know what I mean? What it takes to get you here, whether or not it makes sense to do so. I am very, very surgical when it comes to the Lakers. Surgical, bro. As it pertains to if you're performing and you're representing it right, I want you here. You could be my little brother. If you ain't wearing a uniform right, I'm going to respectfully want you to take the coat. Uniform off and sit right next to me and let's root for the team together. Because the way I see it is nobody wants to be a playing basketball Laker than me. And I just simply wasn't blessed with the talent. You feel me? So it's, And I don't feel there's three people that can overpower my will if I were great at something. So if I had the talent of Michael Jordan, I don't think Jordan could beat me. So when I, when I look at it like that, it's like, okay, if I can sacrifice my desire to be a Laker, I can refuse anybody the right to put on the uniform if it makes sense for the betterment of the team because I'm certainly going to sit down and take off the uniform every day because I can't play and I ain't about to ruin the squad if they were allowed me to play. So it's one of them situations where it's like if I sacrifice that, I'll sacrifice anybody's spot on the team to ensure we're better. Kyrie's, Shaq's, anybody. And so with that being said, what I would want for Kyrie to do is to continue to play well, continue to mind what it is that he has to mind, but also be cognizant of the pluses and minuses of his fluctuating value. Meaning, every time he do something like this, he brings his value down. But that's not necessarily a bad thing for my Laker fans here because what we want is you to come at the most reasonable price possible. Now, that might not be good for your pocketbook, but it will be good for our chance to win a championship together. So if you want to continue to post anti-Semitic stuff, if that's what you think is going to get Joe side and wave you, and so we can sign you for, for a price that, that helps us, uh, that's going to be something my selfish behind is going to benefit from. But that wouldn't be advice I'd give somebody I'm cool with. I'd be like, yo, if you want to keep your career... The sacrifice uh, for the time being to keep that keep that money flow going is worth it because you can do a lot more with the money than you can do being disruptive and them taking it from you. But, but if there's some other things going on that help take care of all that on the back end, then go forward, brother, because I'm with you. You know what I'm saying? But 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 know what you're doing, know what you're sacrificing, so you don't regret what what you do. That's always a mistake for a guy like Kyrie. He'll be disruptive. 
they'll throw the bad energy at them. Then it's like, whoa, well, don't don't take this. No, you got to be ready for them to take that. You got to be ready for them to throw that at you. And the reaction that you have should be that of which is somebody who initiated said things, because that's exactly what you do when you do certain things. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not I'm not going to swing at somebody not expecting to swing back. And, I, and, and even though I'm justified in my swing, even though I'm going over there to save somebody's life, does not mean I don't expect a full-fledged fight that I could possibly lose if I don't do what I need to do to keep myself upright. Right? Whether your intentions are good or wrong, if you don't come in the right way, it can still be to your detriment. So that's, that's why we speak the way we speak. I don't know if that has anything to do with anything, but... You know, Kyrie's been playing great, 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 great. And then this whole situation came and he played horribly. And I'm just like, man, I know. I know that that could be that that had a lot to do with what was going on in the basketball game. I was looking at what was going on. A lot of the time Caruso was guarding him. I'm a Laker fan. I know exactly what type of defensive hound Caruso can be. Um, so even though Kyrie's one of the most, if not the most gifted dribbler, there gonna be some nights where great defenders are gonna be able to keep up with him, and and Caruso's one of them type of guys. So I get that might have been something, but you know the distractions of the team, the coach, the the owner coming out speaking, and all that other stuff. I'm sure it, it takes a toll. All the pundits are, are coming to to uh, condemn you in unison. You know what I mean? But like I said, nobody wants to spearhead that conversation. Nobody wants to say, "Yo, can we challenge what this is?" from within the paywall of what they're working with. So they got to condemn them. It's ugly, man. But Jalen Brown showed us exactly what it is of the Boston Celtics. He showed us exactly what it is. He condemned Kanye on paper by way of his people that he works for and with so he didn't lose what he had to lose. And he came back on the other side and said, yo, they forced me to do that. I didn't want to do that. Kanye's my boy. This helps us understand exactly what's there. It's part of the plan in regards to Ye, I think it's like, I said the same thing about um, Nori's apology. Like, all of that is uniformed just the same because these things come with what Ye's doing. So he had to know these people got to do these things in order to keep that thing going. It's part of the plan in my mind. You, you, This comes with that. <laughs> so as far as I can tell, uh, you know, that's what there's to see. A lot of people are condemning Kyrie, and they don't really want to. A lot of people are condemning Kyrie, and they secretly are watching the documentary, learning things, preparing what their rebuttal will be for the condemning that they're doing right now. And that's what people need to understand. This is what you need to understand. And this is what I understand without actually being in those rooms. Some of these people are condemning Kyrie without actually knowing what he posted. They were told to condemn Kyrie because of a key word, anti-Semitic. And anytime that word is applied, the definition is already set for you to understand. So you ain't about to question it. And you've been told not to. The guys adhere to that. They've feared that their entire careers. This has been in place since before they even got their career started. So they've been taught that this is something to obey. You got to understand this. People were running around in 1989 obeying this rule as if it's supposed to be in place because it's just the way the world is. We hadn't gotten to certain places in regards to social understanding. So we were still bound by certain understandings that kept us in the dark age back then. That wasn't considered dark age stuff because we were just incrementally coming out of the nonsense. So that's where we were. It's like an elevator and you're on level 28 going up to level 50. That's where we were with the progress. So you can still call people anti-Semites and this and that without questioning whether or not they actually were hateful. We're entering a space where for the very first time that is not the case. And those behind the paywall of these various companies, they're behaving the way they've always known they should because this is how it's been, and this is how it's been, and this is how it's been. So the mentality is, I adhere to this every day. I might have something on my mind. I ain't going to say it. I've been trained not to say it. I was trained by people who know what they're doing, and they've lasted this long by doing it this way. They don't play around with anti-Semitism. They can play around with other things, but they don't play around with the N-word. They don't play around anti-Semitism, and they don't play around with the LGBT community. Like, we're trained to, regardless of what your opinion is. And that's essentially what Shaq was trying to convey without conveying it. They're like, he wants to be, make people happy. He's not actually conveying what his opinion is. He doesn't want you to know what his opinion is. He doesn't want you in on that. He wants to remove the, 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 the politics from the sport so that he can talk about things that make people happy. Now, once he has to talk about things that make people happy, he feels uncomfortable. But I'm willing to bet that some of his opinions will make you uncomfortable. 
but he's not looking to make you uncomfortable. He's looking to make you happy, and he's looking to make money. And see, that's the thing. It's like everybody has different objectives, but they all have the same agreement. <laughs> Some people want to be woke. Other people don't have no woke bones in their body, but they all have to be under the same agreement because they're all in the same, on the same group. You know, they're all in the same bubble as it pertains to this business thing. They adhere to the same rules and agreements so they can all make sense. So this is where the rubber meets the road. And we're meeting that place where it's like corporate has yet to understand what it is that they're going to work into their equation because of this error. Now it's not going to be as simple as to call black people anti-Semites. Now it's not as simple as to say anti-Semite this. Now they got to define what that means. Now they got to put it in words, the different divisions of anti-Semitism so that people can understand what the difference between being a Hitler and being a Kanye. Until they define that, the corporate uh, way of doing things is just going to be a bit archaic for the meantime. And there's going to be a lot of people who agree with that because they don't know not to. Because it's been going on forever. So that's why I tell people, man, I'm just watching this. This is just before everybody wakes up to what it is that's appropriate for what's about to be. You know, this is not a one-sided conversation. And if you're not respecting the other side of the conversation, you're going to be just as uh, in the red in regards to your social point of view with your company so i know that i'm watching all of them make early mistakes i'm going to see them walk them all back and then we're going to see them start to try to educate people on the best way to have this conversation and you're going to see some pushback from people who have enjoyed enjoyed the fruits of things being the way that it's been and you're going to probably see more uh reactions to that up roar because i know they ain't going to just move over and say okay you guys can can be what it is we define as anti-semites and it ain't gonna be no problem no they're not going to do that they're not going to do that. But the problem is the hypocrisy from which that is, uh, there will not be any let up. You, you're not going to be able to go backwards in progress as it pertains to our people and as it pertains to what it is that we know about ourselves and what it is as it pertains to what it is we're willing to admit to the world that we've understood since starting this, this process of understanding. So it will be no walking it back. We're not going to say, no, we're not going to have this conversation. We're not going to say, okay, we're sorry. We're never going to challenge this conversation. No, no we're, that's over with. There's no going backwards in this conversation. There's only moving forwards in this conversation. And any deflection from the conversation is going to be met with more conversation about the subject. So that's where we're at with it. I'm not afraid of the conversation um, at all. The more I have the conversation, the less I feel I'm wrong for having the conversation. I think this is a loving, peaceful conversation. And I think that some of the people who brought it up are still trying to figure out how best to bring it to the table. Because they're in this environment where they're going to be called bad guys and they're anticipating being called bad guys for bringing it up. So I think that has something to do with the energy they're bringing to the table when bringing it up. That's the sadness. It's like, do, do, we, do we have that worked into our equation? If you know you're going to be scolded for doing something... Before you do it, you're going to have a certain attitude about it. <clears throat> you are. You're going, to have it, you're going to have an attitude about it because you know you're about to get some bad energy. So you're bracing yourself for what's coming. I think people need to consider that when they're considering Kyrie and Kanye in regards to this conversation. Just for whatever it's worth. <clears throat> you know, it's just... I just get frustrated because I know where this actually stems from. See, we've lived in a country and in a way, a world where anytime black people come together for any reason, it's considered militant and dangerous. It's a Kaepernick, Kaepernick like conundrum where they can pervert the meaning of what it is you're doing and then promoted in such a way and the people who agree with them and the people who believe them run with that and then it just becomes a false truth I don't I wasn't around for those times right so I ain't gonna speak on stuff that I do not know but what I can say is I was always told by people who were in my life that I trusted that a lot of what we were told about the groups that we had weren't necessarily the origin of how them groups were started. And a lot of times them groups and the meaning and what it is that they were doing were perverted and ruined by Trojan horse-like infiltrators who pinned people against one another, brought different things to the equation that were not good, and let those things ruin those groups and then from there paint those groups as if they're the worst thing in the world. 
and then from there the evil takes it from there and the, and the people just run with the culture that's been created by the nonsense revenge takes place people start hurting each other and it just goes back and forth without anybody questioning any thing but the groups originally started with people trying to help their community the groups originally started with people trying to fight against white supremacy the groups originally started with people trying to fight their way out of poverty together as black people all of these groups all these gangs that i'm aware of and the origin started with people trying to be positive trying to push themselves out of situations pull themselves out of gutter and ended with them ultimately being war-torn groups with death being what attached to their flag. Think about it. Every cluster of blacks considered a gang. You can't even have six, seven black people in one spot without them looking at you saying you're a posse or something and therefore you're a problem. Anytime we come together for any reason, it's a threat. So the anti-Semitism conversation is definitely a byproduct of that. That, It's, it's that. Because essentially what the anti-Semitism conversation is usually about is black people coming together to question what it is that's going on in regards to that situation. That's why most of the anti-Semites are usually people that look like me. Nine out of ten times you see that word, it ain't applied to nobody else. It's just us. It's always us. And it's never, ever properly defined. It's just labeled and condemned. What it is, is people questioning. And what it is, is them banishing people for doing that. Learned, agreed upon behavior that does not necessarily appear fair to me. It's like, I know I'm not a posse when I come together. I know if I don't have... Um, a bunch of if I have a bunch of my friends with me and they happen to all be black it doesn't necessarily mean that we're looking to mob against anybody but we know that since we're in that cluster before we even get to that cluster we are now considered a posse or a mob see how that ties into what I was saying a little earlier you anticipate certain things so you bring it a certain you bring a certain energy to it I know people are sick of me taking the onus off of black people I listened to my my video yesterday where I had all the information wrong on uh, takeoff and his passing. I had it all wrong. It was like 6 in the morning. I just saw one little post and I got on the camera. <laughs> but one thing I was mentioning is how I'm sick of having the conversation be about black folks having, taking onus for what it is that they've done to each other. That's obvious. Of course, we're, we're literally doing things to each other. It's obvious. But what I understand is that where we are is not our land. These are not our agreements. This is not our language. We didn't promote the things that we are in love with to ourselves. We didn't create the companies that we purchased these liquor from, these guns from. We don't know. We don't have any coca leaf plants in our communities. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? All the stuff that we have was brought to us. All of it. Even the culture from which we kill each other over. was promoted to us through our music. They reinforce these agreements. And then they sit back and say, in the presence of all this manipulation and suggestive energy, that the people are supposed to ignore the suggestive nature of what it is they're, they're physically re investing in. Things that are supposed to be in our mind to keep us reinforced doing the same stuff over and over again. And the agreements that this is the way it's supposed to be so we'll fight the rejection of it. This is, this is mind control. And then they sit back and act like they're not doing anything. See, look at these blacks. They're not, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're not ignoring all of this invested mind control technology nonsense that we've been putting in their heads for 100 years. That they need to be fighting each other instead of looking for solutions to what's going on you know they need to be fighting each other instead of educating one another and finding their ways to stay keep their families together so they can have a strength about their family and raise strong people you know what i'm saying this is not what's being promoted to us i can see if the music was black people rise every single day at the top of the charts black people go to school love yourself black people put on some clothes that 
that make you look as if you can be respected in situations where otherwise people want to label you a, a slut or a gang member or something. They're not reinforcing those agreements. It's sex. It's drugs. It's I will mess with your woman. It's I will take your life. It's I will get back at you for taking my friend's life. It's all of these different agreements. Give me the drugs. And no one's going to question it because it's what's been going on the whole time. No different than the anti-Semitism crap. Everything just happens to have been going on forever. So therefore, it's like, well. And they know that. That's the thing about us, me. They know that. We're the ones that are cloaked behind the understanding, the confusion of, is it our fault? No. Did you bring yourself anything? No. Well, then it's not your fault, buddy. Once you start controlling what's going on in your head, once you control what comes your way, with the agreements that you have in your household coupled with the entertainment that you see, if all of those things align with your, with your fundamentals and what you're about, and they're impressing the, the proper things into your head, then you... If you go against that, then there's something strange going on. That's what I'm saying. If you go against that, then there's something very weird going on. If you're only seeing positive images and, 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 and uplifting images and you still find it in yourself to create the image of Megan Thee Stallion in your head and then you go outside and be a, that image while nothing like that is being promoted to you, you're very, very super creative and, and you're going to be uh, considered a, a, a bold leader in this world. But that's not what it is. No, these are these are images that are put on you. Every dance move, every move that you have is is a rhythm that's been placed in your face by someone who invested in someone else putting it in your face. Different cadences that you love in your songs, all of that stuff. Used before, given to you again. And this is what I understand. So when we talk about whether or not black people need to take a responsibility for what they do and get your accountability going, I say yes. It starts with finding who the hell's behind the curtain and holding them accountable first for the crap that comes into our heads. And then once we have control over that, we can start rearranging what it is that we're doing based on what it is that we're putting into our skulls every day. But until we figure out that the stuff we're putting into our skulls every day it's helping reinforce the same negative energy that otherwise we have a hard time breaking. And we won't realize we're getting a lot of help with the behavior that we're having, that we're engaging in. You don't realize you're getting a lot of help. But you feel yourself being pushed along into the, into the devil's hands. This is why I don't respect accountability. Give me accountability when I control the environment. Give me accountability when I control what's going on in my head. Give me accountability when I don't have people investing in my failure. Then I'll tell you it's my fault for everything I'm doing. But when I understand suggestive, psychological, suggestive nonsense that's being put into our music, put into our games, put into the stuff that we view, reinforced through the media of who we are and what it is that we're about so that we see people a certain way and behave as if we're anticipating certain energy. These are things that are real. I had a conversation with a friend of mine a long time ago. <clears throat> I told her, I was like, I don't like the looks that I get from people when I walk down the street because I think they're looking at me as if they think I'm going to do something I ain't going to do. Now, this is back when I lived in a Caucasian neighborhood. And, and I told her that. I was like, I don't like how I feel when I walk down the street. I go to the grocery store and white people switch their they bags and go to the other side as if they think I'm going to snatch a purse or something. I never snatched a purse in my entire life. Never stole a dollar from nobody. But I get treated like I'm a bad guy. It's because the agreements and the suggestive nature of what's put out there in place for people to think about people who look like me. Yes, these things are happening, but they're also being promoted to you. If you only saw an image of me being a goddamn superhero, that's all you would think of. The only thing you saw of me was being a basketball player, that would be all you think of. But since you see me as a gang member, a crackhead, and all these different things, you're going to think that too. And do those people exist? Of course they exist. But the agreements that you have about where they are and how often you're supposed to see them and whether or not they're going to be every single black person you see, that's stuff that's suggested to you. By stuff that you see on the idiot box, by stuff that you hear in the music, by stuff that you read in the paper, etc. <laughs> they tell you who's out there, you see these people, and then you think they're them. And this is how it works. These agreements are first suggested to us. And who has control of all of that? But if you listen to Yay, he's saying the Jewish people. You know, like straight up. You say, you listen to these people, they say it's them. You get you listen to the eight billion dollar guy who's walking through the doors that no other black people can get through. He's telling you it's Jewish people behind those doors. What am I supposed to say? 
I've been hearing about bad contracts and bad business practices and, and, and anti-Semitism misdirection since I was three, four years old. Since I was like four years old. You understand what I'm saying to you? So, like, this conversation is personal to me because I just know about how this all is implemented into how people view one another, view themselves. It's like if there's somebody behind the curtain, if there are people behind the curtain who are keeping this up and, and enjoying the plunder, and then we find out they're not who they say they are and they're really some division of white supremacy, then we can understand why the world has been run the way it is. And then we can see why business is so very impossible for certain people to come up, why education isn't being put... Uh, money and funding isn't putting education into certain areas where certain people live while other people the streets is clean while education is is top notch in other areas and stuff it's like come on man they've been controlling where the money go and don't we know that this is not a secret this is not a fallacy this is not a joke this is not alleged this is what we know so while we're still pretending like we don't know this and we see some of our favorite celebrities terrified in the presence of these, these circumstances that are placed upon them by who's behind the curtain, you can clearly see why the fight is necessary. You can clearly see why the conversation is necessary. You can clearly see why this energy is warranted. And if you don't see it, then I don't know what to tell you. I think I've articulated my point of view and I think some people, you know, they may have not, but I think I've done a good job of telling y'all where it is. As far as I'm concerned, there's lies, there's secrets, and then there's behavior, and then there's the plundering of neighborhoods. <laughs> like people literally neighborhoods, the poor. <laughs> and they don't have a right to ask questions. I'm not rolling. I'm not rolling. I'm just not. So that's what I feel about all of this. <laughs> that's what this conversation has done for me. Uh, it's just further made me understand where I want to stand in regards to this. Yes, black people need to be accountable. Yes, we need to take care of ourselves. We need to find out who's behind the curtain, who's been suggesting all this nonsense into our heads, who's been teaching our kids how to hate each other and hate us, who's been pulling the black man out of the home. Because all these things is black man fault. All these things is, is the black home fault. It's all us. We did everything to ourselves. And I hear it more from black people than white people. Don't get it twisted. It's my own people saying, we, we always hold on looking at them saying it. That, my friend, zoom out. What do you control? What are you, are you subjected to? You control very little. You're subjected to a lot. The end. They got your mind, friend. You can try to go against those agreements all you want. All you're going to look like is an ugly ducking in your neighborhood where those agreements are understood. Why? Because everybody's looking at the same stuff you are. They've been looking at the same stuff you've been looking at for the whole time. That's why they all agree. Yeah, we shouldn't say nothing. Nope. Nah, we can't talk about those people. Does it make sense to ask those people questions? Yes. We're going to talk about them? No. We can lose everything. Looking at Shaq and Kenny. All them dudes, they're scared. <laughs> look at Shaq face. He's terrified. Look at Shannon face. He ain't like what he was saying. Those guys don't want to talk like this, man. They would more so rather talk somewhere between me and some understanding of what it is they're trying to get. I really believe that. Somewhere between me, what, I, what I'm saying, it's something that would probably better reflect their own opinion. But they don't want to come out and just condemn this. This ain't nothing to condemn. These ain't own people. This ain't own history they're condemning. Shaq's condemning his own people. Shaq is a seven foot one, one of the strongest human beings in the history of mankind. When we talk about the, the people that we believe we are, he's one of the prime examples of why this is a, is a relevant conversation. Where the heck he come from? You trying to tell me he's just some regular slave out of a backwoods or some jungle? Don't play with me. That's why this conversation is relevant. And to hear Shaq, of all people, like, man, no, Kyrie's a weirdo, or whatever words came out of his mouth, I'm paraphrasing, but Kyrie's irresponsible, whatever. Like, brother, if not for you standing before us, Seven foot one, 360 pounds of godlike figure. If it wasn't for you, this conversation wouldn't even be as relevant, Shaquille. We believe we're the people of God because of people like you. We look at them and don't see nothing like that over there. <laughs>
They ain't got nothing like that. We, the slaves that's supposed to be nobodies, got that. Are you kidding me? That's why it's so disgusting. Look at Shannon Sharp. Brother, you're one of the greatest athletes of all time. Yet another one example of why this thing is real. They ain't got nothing like that over there. See, if all of this stuff wasn't pointed in that direction, this, this wouldn't be as relevant of a conversation. If all this stuff wasn't pointed in that direction, we could shut up, man. But I think this conversation is going to age well because certain things cannot be denied. What I'm saying can't be denied. The agreements of whether or not I'm an asshole for saying it. Yeah, we can pick a time in, in, in different points on the calendar. You could say he's an asshole that year. Maybe not in 20. 40 but in 2022 yeah he was a bad guy for saying that but you can't deny what i'm saying in regards to the things that i'm saying don't make no sense you might not be able to tell what's in my heart when i say those things but you can't say it don't add up this adds up i got 40 minutes out of this i mean i'll make it a therapy session i'm not gonna do too much with this video it'll be another therapy session but y'all know where i'm coming from with this I just want black people to not be afraid to stand up for their own people because the Jewish faith have been long standing up for theirs and that's respectable except the way that it's been handled it's been irresponsible you know you don't treat some people better than others just because you have control over them that's false that's foul that's awful you don't do that to people man and then point at them and tell everybody else, see, they're a bad guy because they're talking about us. No, you're a bad guy because you kind of silence them and not allowing them to have a conversation about you. And I'm a bad guy for saying that. So I'll be the worst guy in the world. In Jesus' name, I'm the worst guy in the world if that's the case. It's because I already know that I've prayed before having these conversations. I already know that I prayed about the people who brought this conversation up. I did. I prayed for those people who were bringing that conversation up before they even started this process so don't think for one second i'm afraid to bring up the conversation for all i know i spiritually conjured it up myself then again it's a therapy session i'm just a little crazy right all i'm saying is this it's time man you don't get to tell us we're bad people no more for wanting to be loving individuals of ourselves and others because what you don't know is there ain't no such thing as black supremacy we're not like that the original people of Judah would never lead people to being bound, man. We wouldn't do that. The people of God know that they are not God. So they ain't going to behave like gods. And that's the end of the conversation. BDL44, thank you all for watching.